have uh, uh, we have two very interesting uh, talks in the next session uh, first one is uh, uh, by dr shobha shiva prasad uh, uh, at morfield from morfield hospital uh, professor in retinal uh, clinical research uh, you know, at university uh, university college london uh, she is known to all of us uh, from kerala and uh, uh, i invite her uh, we are happy to have you amongst us uh, uh, and i invite her uh, to deliver her talks talk on lessons learned from loading dose in amd this is study over to you madam thank you mahesh and good evening everybody uh, can you hear me yes yes clear uh, okay so uh, yes as uh, dr mahesh just said my uh, presentation is on outcome of loading phase of 2 mg aflibercept in neovascular amd uh, it is a precise study and uh, one one may want to wonder why we are doing this study so i'll first declare disclosures the study is funded by boringer ingelheim and there are 10 principal investigators and i acknowledge all of them so the question is why do this now we are all very aware of uh, loading phase and the problem that has arisen now is that we have new durable agents called farizumab as well as 8 mg aflibercept however they are more costly than currently available anti-VEGF agents, especially if biosimilar is around. So at this time, the globe is suffering from severe financial setback. Many of our countries are being asked to use um, biosimilars first and to only uh, do step therapy to the durable agents for X patients and we do not know who these X patients are. Uh, that is why loading phase has become quite important. Secondly, there are about uh, multiple novel long-acting agents that are being trialed, for example, port delivery system, uh, gene therapy, and uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors as just examples. The question they have is, should they start this port delivery system and others after the first injection of aflibercept or should it be after the loading phase? And the reason they ask this is because these newer agents cannot work from day one. They need time to kick in. So what is that time? Is it after one injection of aflibercept or is it after loading phase of aflibercept? So based on all this question, we did this uh, quite a large study. And the research questions are, how do we inform prognosis to our patients presenting to us at the first visit? What baseline OCT characteristics are associated with early residual fluid post-loading? And what is the visual acuity response after one injection versus loading phase? And what are the recommendations we could give to new trial designs for long-acting agents? So as I said earlier, this was a 10-center trial in the UK. And the purpose of this trial uh, as I said, was to look at the visual equity and OCT characteristics of this uh, group of patients. So the eligibility criteria for the study was treatment naive, uh, sorry, I have double words there, treatment naive neovascular AMD with visual equity between 24 and 78 letters who have received three monthly aflibercept injections punctually with a, a eight to 10 weeks post-treatment follow-up. And both eyes could be included if they had bilateral uh, treatment na naive neovascular AMD during the period of the study. And we gathered visual acuity data as well as OCT characteristics uh, for, for a baseline and final visit for all patients. And then second and uh, after the second injection and third injection were optional. So we recruited a total of 2,128 2, patients and 2,274 patients had baseline data for this particular set of questions, we had 2,039 eyes to be analyzed. You can see from the data that our presenting visual equity was a mean of 58 letters, and that showed us that we have improved our referral pathway because most of our previous studies, the baseline visual equity was about 55 letters. Uh, and you can look at the proportion of patients with each categorical visual acuity. For example, patients with very good vision of 68 letters or better constituted a third of the patients in this cohort. 
And uh, due to the UK requirements, you can also see that uh, we do not treat patients with uh, poor visual equity of 24 letters or worse. And uh, altogether with less than 37 letters, we only had about 11% of patients. So the first lesson we learned from the loading phase was what are the baseline characteristics of uh, patients with poor, presenting with poor visual equity. And we defined poor as visual equity less than 54 letters. That is less than 9618. And you can see here, which is quite well understood amongst us, that the presence of baseline foveal involving atrophy, fibrosis, and uh, SHRM are definitely uh, poor visual prognostic markers. Uh, it's interesting that foveal intraretinal fluid has come up as a, as an important association of baseline visual equity of less than 54 letters. PCV patients have less uh, are more likely to have a baseline of less than 54 letters. And of course, if you have subfoveal uh, ellipsoid zone loss or they are ungradable, that means uh, the outer retina is, um, is unhealthy and therefore associated with poor visual equity. Another poor, uh, another important outcome that we noted was increased CST of more than 450 microns. So with all of this together, if we see a patient with a, in the clinic with a CST of more than 450, then they are more likely to end up with poor visual equity as well, rather than the baseline visual equity alone. So these are the uh, findings we have got from this study. Second, we looked at the distribution of uh, early residual fluid after loading phase. And you can see 100% of the patients presented with some form of fluid, either IRF or SRF or both. And you can see that only 50% of the patients after the loading phase had no fluid. So in fact, what we, if we have to, if you are forced to only do step therapy, then 50% of the patients are actually eligible for a non-responder to aflibercept 2 milligram after the loading phase if you only consider visual equity. Uh, oh, sorry, if you only consider uh, fluid. The next is IRF, and you can see 51% uh, of patients had IRF at baseline, which reduced to 21.4% after the loading phase. So that's quite good at resolution of IRF with the loading phase of aflibercept. SRF, uh, it's a major finding in all our uh, lesions. 82.7% had baseline SRF, and that reduced to only 37.3% still having uh, SRF being present. So SRF is a difficult um, type of fluid after uh, to resolve after the loading phase. And we all know that if you have SRF, you will need to give them a lot of injections, but the good news is they preserve their visual equity and we are actually treating the fluid more than the uh, vision. So with this in mind, we can now tell our funders, uh, actually speaking, even if you say that we can only use biosimilars of Lucentis or Aflibercept, we will end up with 50% still having fluid and the need to give uh, um, the newer agents if they agree. So next we looked at uh, what is the visual equity of these patients presenting with different types of fluid. So uh, in the mean baseline visual equity, if you break them by different compartments, you will see that uh, eyes with no um, residual fluid, if you look at their baseline visual equity, they actually fare uh, worse than those with, uh, with fluid. And that is probably because of the presence of SRF in many of these patients. Uh, but the important uh, to note is that patients with intraretinal fluid has the worst visual, pro visual equity at baseline. Now, when you look at their post-loading phase, they, I looked at the adjusted one because adjusted for age, et cetera, you will see that again, it is the IRF, whether it's associated with SRF or not, this is the group of patients with uh, poor visual equity outcomes. So if you have early residual fluid and it is intraretinal fluid, I think we should be using a newer agents if allowed to use. Now we looked at the associations of what are the characteristics of patients with early residual fluid. Uh, 
as I mentioned earlier, increased CST of more than 450 microns. Are patient, are these patients are likely to have residual fluid after loading. So you can decide from baseline itself as to what injection, what type of injection you should be giving to this group of patients. Baseline visual acuity actually is also associated with uh, early residual fluid, but most probably because there are also a considerable number of patients with increased CST in these patients. What is interesting is a non-white ethnicity. We had only about 5% of patients who are non-white, but they were associated with early restoral fluid. So this may apply to the population in India. And presence of SRF, as I mentioned earlier, was also associated with early restoral fluid. So with these in mind, we may be able to come up with a group of patients that are should be using uh, the more durable agents after the loading phase or at least to, or if even better to start off with. Now, there are reduced odds of developing early restoral fluid and it'll be interesting to know that the age group of above 80 years old patients are less likely to have early restoral fluid. RAP lesions, of course, they're present as intraretinal fluid mainly uh, in their stage one and two. So probably RAP lesions, you can understand why they have early, less of early restoral fluid. And foveal atrophy and presence of ORT are all signs of uh, outer retinal disruption probably explain why there is no fluid. Now, we also asked um, an AI team to predict for us which are the eyes with early restoral fluid, but we only gave them very little data. That is age, uh, sex, visual equity, and the CST thickness. And they were not able to predict they only found that increased CST came up, a male gender and a younger age group, all three are associated with early restoral fluid. So based on this, if you see a baseline patient, base, uh, a new patient with baseline visual equity of less than 54 letters and have increased CST and is a female and younger than 80 years old, you we will know that these are the patients who are likely uh, to be of high treatment burden most likely benefit with newer agents. So next we looked at the big question of when should we give uh, longer acting agents uh, which are in the clinical trials, should it be after one injection or after post loading? But it is also important to us in, uh, in clinical scenarios. Because the one question we all have is, should we do one followed by treat and extend or should we load and then followed by treat and extend? So you can see here, our results are that after the loading phase versus after the first injection, they did not show much of a difference. So one would question then why should we load? But a very important uh, difference that we noticed was that there will be more patients who have achieved 68 letters or better, that is 612 or better, if we load them. And in the second half, you will see that there are considerable number of patients with 15 letters or more gainers in the load, loading phase compared to just after one injection. So based on that, we believe that we should load our patients to get the maximum visual acuity outcomes. We also looked at the OCT characteristics of these patients, like what is associated with reduced visual acuity uh, after the loading phase. The same findings came up that is uh, foveal involving IRF, PCV lesions, RAP lesions, and type two lesions versus type one. Uh, foveal involving uh, atrophic features such as um, fibrosis, atroph, oh, sorry. Can you hear, see me or can you have a problem? Okay, um, for, so increased CST, foveal involving atrophy, ORT, fibrosis, and loss of ellipsoid zone in the center, or if you can't grade the EZ zone. So again, however much you look at it, whether it's a baseline visual equity, whether it's gain of visual equity, whether it's early residual fluid, we turn out to be having the same OCT characteristics that account for all this. So lessons from the visual acuity outcome paper is that the improvement of visual acuity is maximum after first injection. On average, there is very little difference between the first 
uh, injection and post loading injection. So if you're using a long acting drug, you can switch from the first deflibercept drug to that. Uh, what I mean here by long acting is uh, port delivery system or newer drugs. But if you're continuing on eflibercept 2 milligram, then we should ensure that they're loaded before they treat and extend. We also looked at patients with no visual acuity gains, that is zero or less visual acuity gains. Again, there's no difference to whatever we looked at. It, it's coming up with the same um, uh, OCT characteristics that are associated with uh, poor vision as well as vision uh, improvement. So I won't go through that again. What, what is very interesting is SHRM. So in SHRM, when we look at no visual equity gains for this particular cohort, we got them as they will, they are a group of patients who can improve uh, despite poor baseline visual equity. And that is probably because not all SHRM are fibrosis. So some sure may just represent fibrinous material and they may respond well to anti-VEGF agents. We also looked at visual acuity outcomes based on uh, uh, subtypes of macular neovascularization. Again, we found that it's only the type one that shows a good baseline visual acuity and remains at good visual acuity uh, at um, post-loading. While uh, the RAP type two and PCV present with poorer visual equity and remain with worse visual equity after the loading phase. And most of them were had a loss or ungradable ellipsoid zone to explain why they have poorer visual equity. We also looked at the fluid outcomes based on the MNV types and a resolution of uh, the fluid was quite, uh, quite dramatic in RAP lesions, especially in early RAP. But a large proportions of MNV types uh, showed IRF resolution, whatever be the MNV types, but SRF was very difficult to resolve, irrespective of lesion types. We also looked at the incidence of RIP because newer agents are telling us that they have more higher incidence of RIP. So we looked at what is the current incidence of RIP in a population where uh, we, we have seen them in clinical practice. So compared to uh, clinical trials, the prevalence of RP RIP at baseline was 4.1%, which is much higher than what we have known of. And 3.5% of eyes developed an RPE tear after the three monthly aflibercept injection, which is also higher than what is recorded in clinical trials. And that is probably because we take all type of patients. We do not exclude patients because they have a high, a higher PED height or whether because they have a PCV. We treat all patients. And probably that explains why we have a higher rate. And when we looked at the disease characteristics associated with RPE RIP, male gender, poor baseline visual acuity of less than 54 letters, high CST, hemorrhagic PED, and increased PED height. Again, PCV and SHRM came up as uh, risk factors for RPE RIP. So we do need to explain our, uh, this to our patients, especially if they are presenting with uh, lower PED height. Then if they are still have a PCV, they have an increased risk of uh, RIP. So in conclusion, we would say that baseline visual acuity of less than 54 letters or Snellen less than 60, 618 is associated with poor baseline visual acuity. They may have gains of visual acuity after their loading phase, but they're never going to have a very good absolute uh, visual acuity of 68 letters or better. 50% of patients have early residual fluid after loading phase and increased CST, baseline poor visual acuity, non-white ethnicity are, and SRF are associated with early residual fluid. AI does at least our, the AI we used from IBM was unable to identify any other risk factors. Of course, we were quite um, unfair to the AI because we did not label the OCT scans and let them know what is IRF or SRF. They had very minimal data, but uh, I just want to point out that this will be the case if you use AI in our clinical practice. When we look at mean VA outcomes, it is best to load patients because they tend to get more 15-letter gainers and more 68-letter group. 
PCV type 2 and RAP lesions have poor visual acuity outcomes compared to type 1 after the loading, and RPA rips are higher in real world than clinical trials. Now, we need to answer our questions. How do we manage our biosimilar versus long-acting drugs? So one question is, if you are on biosimilars, if you are, if you are switching patients, who should we switch? And we recommend switching after loading or, of patients with um, residual fluid. That will account to 50% of patients, and maybe that is something the funders will not allow. So if you may also have to look at those then who did not improve visual equity. And of course the numbers will be lesser, but it's still a considerable number of patients. If continuing on biosimilars, the early residual fluid group will be the ones that would need high treatment burden and therefore should be monitored very carefully and treated with more injections. And if on biosimilars, we need to load them to get their maximum visual equity benefit after the loading phase. For clinical trial designs for the newer therapies like gene therapy, PDS, and TKI, we recommend that they can be switched after the first aflibercept injection, provided these trials actually show us that the visual equity efficacy of these newer agents are similar to aflibercept 2 milligram in longer term trials. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shoba. I think uh, we can have a few questions and discussions. Uh, good evening, Dr. Shoba. Good, good, good evening. Uh, I wanted to ask you, did you analyze the patients who resolved after, whose fluid resolved after the first injection? in terms of as a prognosticator versus those who continued on to the third. Like you you did it at the third uh, injection. But what I've noticed is that there is a subset of patients who resolves in one injection. This is a different group. And so this we, group have, we have the data on one injection, but we, yeah. we load all our patients. So I will not be able to characterize that one injection effect, right? So I can yeah. look at... Uh, uh, the, no, no. The I'm saying you, you, you could do the analysis of how they behaved at the third injection, but I'm saying the patients who resolve in one injection, that subgroup, their outcomes long term are much better than those whom um, you know who did not resolve in the first injection, and then you gave the second injection, they are improving, and then you gave the third one. Now the second subgroup, this is the best subgroup. The second subgroup is, which is intermediate, is those who respond partially to the first group, first injection, continue to either they become dry with the second injection or there's minimal fluid still left and you give the third injection. So those who are continuously improving, this is my suggestion. This is a group which is, and if by the third injection it dries, this is again a group which does very well. But there is a third group where there is very little change over the three injections. Improves, but very slowly. This is the group which should immediately be taken off to, the, to another new drug. Because after three injections, waiting for this group to respond with the fourth and fifth injection doesn't make sense. So, uh, and this is what I've seen in my practice. With the ones who responded in one, I know, you know, sometimes you're giving the loading dose, but you know, I really don't need it. In that case, I give the loading dose because clinically I cannot, and even on OCT, I cannot be 100% certain that it's not going to dry further. Sometimes there's a very minimal amount of change, which you notice after the second injection. So my principle in manage during my management is, I will give the injections as long as I can see an improvement in the OCT. If I see no difference in my next two consecutive OCTs, then I will say now you can be extended. 
as of now we extend this. But if I see that I'm seeing an improvement, I may give the next infusion. So even for a myopic CNV, where you have great results, I'd give the first injection. Now you say it looks okay. I say, no, I just give one more to see whether it can improve any further. And sometimes you'll notice that what looks like just the minimal amount of scar also disappears, which means it had not actually become okay. So that's my way of checking therapeutically whether what I'm considering an endpoint is an endpoint or not. So just a suggestion. No, it is a very good suggestion. Our point, I try to analyze this, but I think I'm influenced because we do not have patients who have responded after first, but then we we did not further give any more injections. So all the patients had loading. And uh, that is the tricky, that's a tricky one. Injections, but just see whether they behave differently. Yeah. No, I, I have a question, uh, Shobha. I mean, this is uh, out of context. I mean, uh, I mean now uh, since uh, you're, I mean, you're in Europe, and so do you think that uh, two or three years down the line, uh, biosimilars are going to be the drugs that all of us are going to be using? I mean, uh, across yeah, the globe. The yeah, that is the big question now, right? Because that is why we had to do this analysis because um, even the... Because they'll be, they'll be cheaper, they'll be much cheaper. The burden on uh, both on the social uh, security schemes and also on the patients who pay from their pockets, both ways there is going to be a lot of saving. And exactly. Be, so, what we have seen with the ranibizumab is that the efficacy of the biosimilars as good as the uh, primary drug, there is hardly any difference. So, do you think, I think that... The bias, was... uh, yeah, it's a very good question and I think uh, that is the direction of travel for the whole world because of this cost econ cost effectiveness. The issue is, uh, it's already translated in the US where they have to start their patients on Avastin and only after they're called a step therapy, so after the three loading doses, they then can sh switch to a second and a third agent. So, as far as I know, they have to switch from Avastin to a biosimilar, then to Farisimab. So they have three switches to go through before they get a long acting. So we are questioned in the same way here. So we are trying all sorts of analysis to show them that, yes, we can use biosimilars, but please allow us to use the long acting agent for the needy people. And we need to identify who they are. And that is why we did this. Yeah, I definitely think... Uh, we have experience only with ranibizumab biosimilars, then they are exactly the same as the originator ranibizumab. But the issue is if we are asked to use ranibizumab instead of farizumab or instead of 8 milligram aflibacid, that is where there will be a challenge for those with persistent fluid. Thank you, sir. I did a cost analysis of farizumab with uh, aflibacid. And what I realized was that the most economical way to handle this is to start with aflibacept, give the three loading doses, and then extend the patient. And you're going to be able to extend some 40% of patients to 16 weeks. That is the cheapest form of treatment available. The, the basic difference that comes is in the eight weeks in which you have ferricimab at something like... Uh, 15 or 18 percent, and you have a flipper at almost 35 percent. So, that is the group where you need to identify the patients who stay on a flipper eight weeks need to be translated to ferricimab. Half of these patients will actually be able to extend on ferricimab. If you see the data, I'm going by the data from the, the two trials. If in these patients, you continue, the ones who extend, you continue on ferricimab, but those who don't need to be, can be maintained even on uh, on aflibacept, and that's the cheapest way to manage it. I think we are Can I ask you, Dr. Can I ask you, Dr. Talwar, so um, this study, the, load, uh, the post loading phase is 8 to 10 weeks after the th third injection. We found 50% are wet. How do you then decide which of these patients should remain on aflibacept or farisumab? You need to give yet another injection, right? That's what you're saying. So, one injection, you'll give more, and then you'll know. And the other thing is, stability does not need it to be dry. 
stability needs it to be to be identical in terms of OCT. That means the fluid should not be increasing. What, because the I think one of the mistakes we make is that if it dries, we will extend. No. Once we've reached the limit of its improvement is when we should extend and see, can we maintain it at that? And if I can maintain with, say, a little bit of fluid at 12 weeks or 16 weeks, that's all I need to do. Uh, I think we are running short of time. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shobha. Uh, we'll have, more, yeah. So I, uh, the, uh, Dr. Argeros uh, is uh, waiting for the next talk. I welcome Dr. Argerios Kronopoulos. He uh, uh, is a managing senior physician, Department of Ophthalmology, Medical Faculty, Manny uh, Heidelberg, and consultant ophthalmic surgeon, Hospital of uh, Ludwig Schaffen, Germany. And he will be talking on the changing treatment paradigm and durability and drying in AMD and DME. Over to you, Dr. Argerios. So, can you hear me loud and clear? I hope so. Many thanks for the invitation. It's a really pleasure and an honor for me to be part of your meeting. So, I'm going to start my presentation on changing treatment paradigm with durability and drying in AMD and DME. So, the first slide is a necessary disclaimer. So, I'm going to show you at the beginning some uh, known statistics. Uh, of course, the uh, gold standard right now for the treatment of AMD and uh, diabetic micro edema is the anti uh, uh treatment. Uh, but of course, uh, this comes with uh, some challenges. Uh, so far, we haven't been uh, able to uh, achieve the uh, best uh, result. We have reached the ceiling effect of the treatment. That's why there is a, a big uh, development of uh, drugs uh, currently around the world. We uh, see that there is an adherence problem and, with the... Uh, Sorry, can you make it slide uh, slideshow? Full screen slideshow? Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah. Is it better now? Uh, it's same actually. It's same. So let me see. What that is on. slideshow. Slideshow. I think. That uh, slideshow, this thing is pressed, but here it is not changing. It is not pressed. The select that lower. No, everything is stuck now.
So sorry about that. There was a connection. Yeah, I, we can hear you. Just uh, share the screen, sir. Yes, sorry about that. I'm coming back again. Connectivity issues. So. I'm going to make this uh, cool. Is it better now? Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, now okay. it is fine. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So sorry about that. Uh, honored to be part of your meeting. So I'm going to be delivering this talk tonight with the uh, treatment paradigm on durability uh, in the treatment of AMD and diabetic macular edema. So we all know that the um, anti-vegetative treatment is the gold standard, uh, both uh, in treating uh, AMD and uh, diabetic macular edema. But we have uh, reached a sort of a ceiling effect. That's why there is a great uh, development of uh, drugs uh, worldwide. Uh, we know that we have an adherence issue, 70% of the patients. We have a, treatment, a high treatment burden. Um, we have a sustainability issue with the drugs. And finally, we have a 60% of non-adherence to the treatment. So this, uh, of course, uh, makes the question very relevant that an agent that would provide maximal sustained vision and longer treatment for intervals might be uh, very useful and actually needed. And what I say by that is I'll take a look at the analysis of how busy the patients are in the getting the treatment uh, in both AMD and diabetic macular edema. They are quite busy in commuting uh, back and forth from their house to the doctor and taking rest, which makes uh, 12 hours of the treatment very relevant and not only for the patient, but also for uh, their family members or uh, caring person for the patient. Um, and uh, from the real world data, we know that uh, in the first year, only uh, the majority of the patients they received less than six injections, which uh, uh, makes kind of uh, the question very relevant. What's, uh, what can we do in order to improve this? Uh, these were the results from the Lumino study uh, compared the uh, Ronibitumab injections uh, treatments, and they show that 37% 73% of the patients they received less than or equal to six injections. And um, of course, you know uh, this slide that uh, we shows uh, what's going on with the real world, uh, with the uh, um, with the uh, randomized control trial, uh, and how the frequency of the injection is uh, and the results are compared to the real world results, uh, which show um, less effectiveness in vision and less effectiveness in durability and uh, drying so that so which makes the question very relevant how could could we go from the results on the left hand side and uh, implement it to our current uh, treatment paradigm in the right hand side let's see uh, what's happening in the treatment of uh, amd we know that the bronzizumab map has been very effective uh, in the registration trial uh, has showed comparable vision gains, but with more fluid resolution in at week 96. Um, and you all know these graphs. Uh, the gray line represents the aflibercept uh, drug. And uh, we show here, I show here both uh, graphs from the Fox trial and the Harrier trial, uh, which been in part of the uh, European Union. And you know, uh, as you see the uh, the, the graphs, uh, you see that the gray trial, uh, the gray uh, line, had more zigzags uh, than the uh, blue line, which is the bronzizumab, which means that the drug is uh, very, very effective in drying the retina. Uh, you see how many tissues being gained with uh, not that uh, not that many uh, irregularities. Um, what's going on in the real world right now? We have many studies, uh, some of them uh, post hoc analysis, one of which is uh, from the group of uh, Tara Gillo, and uh, from a German professor, Mr. Holtz, uh, where they did a very uh, an interesting analysis uh, from the uh, Hawk and the Herod data. Um, they show that prolocytosumab achieves a faster and sustainable dryness in AMD patients compared to aflibercept. If you take a look on the left-hand side, on the column, the light, uh, the middle gray one, shows a greater percentage of, of patients with uh, drier retina. And not only this, 
they also showed that uh, the probability of dryness uh, in uh, consecutive, more than consecutive, three consecutive visits is more probable to be in patients that they receive rosuzumab compared to the patients uh, treated with a copanato, which was uh, a flibercept. These are very interesting uh, um, um, data. So, um, in the one more study that I found, which is also very, very interesting, uh, was a simulation of what could have happened from the same patient from the Hawk and Harrier trial um, if they would have been allocated in treatment as well as Q8, Q12, and Q16. What the, uh, what the group of uh, Michael Singer did is that they extrapolated all the data they had from the higher and the, uh, the hook uh, study, and they uh, defined two groups uh, based on the activity of the disease of the NAMD. And they found out that 78% and 76% of patients in the polycythemap, they would have had a greater or equal interval of treatment up to Q12. And over half of the patients, they would still gain in their treatment interval because they would be allocated to Q16 every four weeks. So brolicizumab, even in this simulated study, demonstrates both durability and action of effectiveness. Um, of course, we also did our own uh, study in Germany, which has already been published. And we looked uh, in both uh, recalcitrant cases of AMD uh, with uh, the particularity of PED. We checked, uh, of course, the best corrected visual acuity. We checked the central retina thickness before and after treatment. And also we analyzed the effect of the treatment of PED before and after treatment. As you can see, our patients, uh, they had a considerable number of injections, which uh, uh, almost comes up to a year, uh, with a mean number of injections of about 10. Um, we had uh, all types of uh, AMD uh, in this analysis. We had uh, 20 eyes that were treated. And um, I'm going to explain to you what this graph shows over here. In the left-hand side, you see indication of anti-VEGF. This was what, how all started when the patient came in the clinic for the very first time where we indicated the anti-VEGF treatment. Uh, in the second column, you see the indication of up when the patient started responding uh, to the treatment. And at the end, in the uh, third column, you see the end-loading dose of up. Uh, after the end of the loading dose with rosuzumab. And in both cases, in both panels, you can see the left-hand side, which is the vision, and the right-hand side, which is the uh, response of the tissue, you can see significant improvement uh, and faster improvement under bolosuzumab uh, in, both, in both cases, vision and tissue. What's very interesting is this case, this is one, uh, it's one typical example of those patients that we treated. The left-hand side, as you can see, is a patient as it came in the consultation for the first, first time with a great PD, a uh, significant subretinal fluid. So the patient was put on anti VGF, um, one of the um, other anti VGF drugs. Um, and uh, after a, a certain uh, time, when the, uh, um, when the uh, indication of the bolosuzumab was set, we uh, do see that the PD is still significant, that there's subretinal fluid, and we changed the treatment to bolosuzumab and was a massive reduction of CRT and PED following treatment switch. Um, we also did, uh, we took this one step further with the Cyrus of PD that we have in the clinic. It allows you to uh, uh, measure different metrics of the PED. So if you uh, conceptualize the PED as a volume, there is a surface of the PED on the surface of the retina. There is a volume underneath. So we check what's happening and how much is improving. You have a reduction of PED metrics of about 63 percent and 62 percent after which uh, treatment and these are uh, the two numbers they uh, correspond to the uh, two circles that you see on the left on the right hand side which is based uh, on the uh, uh, on the software that the Cyrus OCD is using so in conclusion up reduces effectively from what we have seen so far uh, from our practical experience and the studies used effectively the disease activity not only in registration trials but in real life conditions Prolocizumab achieves dryness and to stay dryness in comparison to other anti VGF agents. The time to achieve IRF and SRF freedom is shorter in Prolocizumab in comparison to other anti VGF. And the Prolocizumab allows effective extension of treatment of the Q12 in the majority of patients. So, this is as far as uh, AMD is concerned. 
Now, what about the DMA thing? Um, you all know that uh, from the uh, Ponsberg trials, uh, Rise and Ride, Rene Bizuma, Vivid and Vista, F. Libertep, and also the uh, independent trials, which is which are the very interesting trials from uh, the DRCR network, we have also persistent DME. Either we have it on OCD, which is active fluid in the tissue, or we have it in the angiography. Rise and Ride, for instance, they have to spend 6% of OCD patients that they don't respond uh, uh, optimally and 74% uh, in the angiography. The same happens to the uh, Vivid and Vista trial, but also the uh, independent ones. They have shown that over 30% of patients in the protocol lie, they have still chronic macular edema. And uh, protocol D, which uh, compared the aflibercept, bevacizumab, and ranibizumab, they have also considerable uh, percentage, um, which makes us think, what could we do better for the patients, or how uh, do we start treating the patients? Uh, and when I started using the bolicism up, I took a look on what the IRIS registry uh, trials have shown. Uh, IRIS registry is a big registry in the United States uh, with data is a very big database uh, where social security uh, put in their data. And uh, the colleagues did something very, very interesting. They took all data uh, in the database. Uh, and you can see the dots. Uh, they came from all sorts of different uh, eye care, uh, eye treating uh, um, uh, colleagues, which is optometrists, uh, non retinal ophthalmologists, and retinal specialists. At the end, they asked the question how do we treat those patients? What is, for instance, the first treatment that they do from the beginning of the treatment or from the beginning of uh, the uh, realization of the disease uh, up to one year? Uh, they had a very considerable number of patients, which were 13,410. And you can, if you look at these uh, columns, this was like the uh, summary or the conclusion, what happened to those patients is that in the very first, in the, in the, fr the first monad, 28 days uh, from, the, uh, uh, from the realization of the disease uh, up to a year, the vast majority of the patients, they have still, they have only been observed. Uh, a small, small percent of the patients who received um, drugs in the form of uh, uh, ranibizumab or aflibercept or bevacizumab. Uh, and even a small percentage of patients, they receive laser, corticosteroids, or combination of treatments. And if you look at the right-hand side, uh, you see the patients that they receive the treatment, which is the dotted line uh, with the rectangle. It's, uh, they improve the treatment, they improve the vision uh, as expected. The other one stagnated. So the real-world data, they show that from the Iris trial, that uh, the patients received less injection compared to the uh, randomized clinical trial. We know now from the registration trial that uh, prolucizumab, the new agent, uh, um, uh, it has considerable vision gains uh, comparable to aflibercept and a better drying. Now, you all know this graph. The uh, orange line is the uh, prolucizumab 6 milligrams. And you see, for instance, uh, in the lower panel, in the type uh, uh, trial, how uh, better the uh, tissue gain is uh, in patients compared uh, receiving borosizumab compared to the patients receiving the comparator. And not only that, we have more borosizumab treated eyes that achieve, achieve a better anatomic result after a year and, a, and at week uh, 100 despite lower number of rejections. This is the, the middle column, the orange one. And you can see uh, on the top of the, uh, of the graphs, uh, the injection received by the patient, which is times seven and times nine. And not only that, we had a fewer patients treated with the bolicizumab that had interretinal fluid or subretinal fluid, both of which 20, uh, 52 and 100, despite lower number of injections. Um, of course, the uh, DME uh, question comes a little bit later than the AMD. Uh, so currently, there are only 32 uh, studies in PubMed. And one very interesting uh, real-world study is from a colleague of mine uh, in Germany who uh, analyzed uh, prospectively um, 32 eyes uh, treatment naive uh, or the cancer having diabetic macular edema uh, and found out 
that with brosizumab compared to the comparator, which was Iflibercept, they have a better um, functional result in vision in both groups, which is the treatment naive and the uh, recalcitrant. Uh, and they have a comparable anatomic effect patients with uh, with uh, prosizumab. But very, very significant is what they managed to show that at week 36, the main treatment interval for brosizumab was 11.3 weeks, which is considerably longer than the comparator with a flibber set six for five weeks. And the switch patients were also longer, 9.3 weeks compared to 5.3 weeks. Very interestingly, one thing that they haven't heard about that, that they haven't uh, commented, but I have to say this, is that the patients we have, which are treatment naive, and it's also my experience, they, they respond much better to the treatment of brochizumab than patients who have recovered from DME. So we also analyze our data in the clinic, and we analyze the primary and uh, switch indications of diabetic macular edema. With the endpoints, of course, the vision, the function, and the uh, anatomy, but we also took it a little bit step a step further, uh, asking about the uh, tissue response as far as the, the perfusion is concerned. We had 32 eyes, um, and our patients, they also had uh, treatment previously with ranibizumab, aflibercept, and dexamethasone. Um, we can confirm the, uh, the function of the drug, uh, which leads to a significant better functional results um, and better anatomic results. But what is much more important, sorry about the German uh, legends over here, much more important if you look at the lower panel is that the vascular density and the perfusion density is getting better in those patients treated with up compared with other drugs. And I've brought one, uh, one uh, OCTA with me. You can see um, the area uh, designated uh, in the upper uh, panel, the area designated with the white lines, how much better is the signal that we get from the OCTA uh, before and after treatment with brosizumab. And you can see on the right-hand side in the lower panel how much the difference is uh, compared to before treatment and after treatment with brosizumab. Now, these things, these are... Uh, this is our show us that brosizumab is really working quite well in those patients. Of course, um, many colleagues in Germany and uh, throughout the world, they're very um, concerned about the use of the drug because of the uh, um, complications that might arise, as we know, uh, from the launch of the drug uh, with, the, uh, with the vasculitis that we saw in all those patients. This is the uh, first uh, publication of the, uh, of the safety uh, profile of the drug. Uh, there were 15 from 12 patients identified in 10 surgeons in the United States. And all the patients they were treated before, they had to let to, 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 to 80 injections in the affected eye. And retinal vasculitis, or IOI, were diagnosed at the mean of 30 uh, days interval following up injection. And if you uh, break down uh, the analysis, uh, the, the data that we have from the Hawk and the Higher trial, you uh, can see on the right-hand side that we only had a vision of about less than 1%. And we had uh, retinovascular occlusion and vasculitis, something between 3.3% and 2.1%. In another analysis, uh, uh, which was from 2023, uh, from Professor Marco Zarbin, um, they also analyzed the safety profile of the drug uh, with uh, 6,285 eyes. Uh, coming down to the... Uh, percentage of retinal vascular occlusion in 24 eyes, 1.2%, and atelier occlusion in about four, five, four eyes, 0.2%. As far as my experience is concerned, um, I have to honestly say, uh, from all the patients I've treated so far, uh, and the studies are published, I have seen only one case with suspected vasculitis, one patient that I've treated uh, at the beginning of the uh, of the. Uh, um, registration of the drug in the European Union. Um, this was a patient known to us uh, since 2016, which was who was referred with exudative AMD. He was treated in 2018 with Lucentis, uh, up to 2020 with a vision of 0.6, uh, where he stopped responding optimally to the drug. So in April 2020, we uh, decided to uh, switch the patient to up one month later, after the third uh injection, 
So he had received already three injections of bolcizumab, and one month after the third injection, the patient consulted complained of irritation and vision dropped to 0.5. So the patient was examined in the clinic. He had a cell in the anterior chamber and vitreous uh, also with cells. We did um, an angiography and we found discrete signs of retina vasculitis. So of course, the patient was stopped. Uh, uh, treatment was, uh, was stopped. We treated with prednisone 60 milligrams for three days and further with local uh, steroids for further eight days. Um, almost at the same time as these things happened, there was a very interesting and useful publication from the German group of Professor Flyer. Uh, I'm sorry about this, but this is in, Ger uh, in German. It shows an algorithm of how you can treat those patients. So first of all, you uh, realize what's uh, happening with the patient. If the patient comes in with complaints, you, uh, you realize that there is uh, you, uh, there is a uveitis, uh, anterior or posterior uveitis. And uh, depending on the uh, side of the inflammation, you either treat with topical steroids or if there is a, an intermediary uveitis, posterior uveitis, you use oral steroids as well to treat the patient until there is no sign of infection. So all in all, take home message, the brocizumab is a very effective and stabilizing drug for the both, both for the AMD and the uh, DME. It has a faster function on improvement and reduction, which translates to reduction in treatment burden. And of course, as you know, brosizumab is a very small molecule, which has distinct advantages for faster tissue penetration and concentration in vitro and retina. Many thanks for uh, listening to my talk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Argarios, uh, uh, for that nice, nice uh, presentation. Uh, Thank you. And uh, since we are uh, running out of time, I think probably we can wind up the session. Once again, uh, thank you uh, for the uh, nice talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. I request Dr. Sai Kumar to please give the mementos to our panelists.